Welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. Welcome and please say hello in the chat. If you're visiting from another ethical society or another Unitarian Universalist congregation, please give a shout out to that as well. If you want to share your chat messages with everyone, please be sure that your settings in the chat are at everyone. And this is a good time to get a candle to light during our candle lighting. If you would like to do that, then settling into a comfy seat with a beverage of choice as we continue to gather. And let me see who, uh, who we have here this morning. It is good to be here. And we have all kinds of people saying good morning. And Lynn Cox says, good morning all. It is so good to see your names popping up in the participant list. And yes, it is, Robin. Good morning, y'all. There's a solid chance. I broke out my Halloween candy this morning. Uh, oops. Oh, was that my, was that her out loud voice? Um, out loud chat? Perry B says, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, Judy, Lynn, and everyone, says Donna Taylor. Joanne, Joe Klein says, Hi all from Joe and Darwin, who I believe is a feline, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Peter Bishop, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Peter. And good morning, Wes and Judy from Jeff Me Hall. Oh, no, not the comfy chair. Well, I, I guess you could sit in an uncomfortable chair if you wanted to. Joe says, good morning, all. Rajesh, hi, Judy, Lynn, and all. Shirley Storms, good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh, it is so nice to see so many names and hellos. Trang says, hi everyone, great to be with you this morning. It is indeed. Good morning, good people of Wes from Vincent. Good, good morning, yes. Uh, <laughs> Jeff Mihal. oh yes, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Okay. Um, it's too early in the morning for that silliness. Okay. So it is really delightful to be here. Um, so if you are uh, so inclined or go, oh, well, yes, uh, have a beverage and a comfy seat and, um, we will get ready. Art Delibert, I don't want to mangle your last name, says good morning after a long absence. Uh, and Lynn says welcome back, Art. Adam Limehouse, hello everyone. And Vincent Tyler, also known as Laura, <laughs> says, says hello. I, I realize that clearly you are not one and the same, but I gather you're sharing a computer. so. Okay, I am going to get us going here. <sighs> hmm. Okay. We begin today with gratitude. We're grateful for the air, the water, the sun, the earth that sustains us. We're grateful for our communities of human and more than human beings who hold us in a web of relationships. We begin today with memory. We remember our ancestors, our role models, our loved ones, the people who instructed us on how to be in right relationship. We remember the original people of this region, the many nations who met at the Chesapeake, such as the Piscataway, the Pamunkey, the Upper Mattapony, the Rappahannock, and the Potawomac. And we remember that their descendants are still here among the more than 4,000 Native American people who live in the District of Columbia. We remember people who came later, those who arrived searching for freedom, those who arrived enslaved, those who arrived to join family, those who arrived to be part of a liberating community, those who arrived in service to their ideals. We remember a complex, sometimes painful, sometimes hopeful history. We begin today 
with awareness. We're aware of the growing climate crisis. We're aware of the need for truth and reconciliation. We are aware of injustice, and we are aware of the potential for, for healing, the opportunity for change, and the power of community. We begin today with being present. Let us rest in the music to follow from guest musician Micah Handler.
Wow. That was really delightful. Good morning again, and welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. I'm Judy Myers, and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the officiant this morning. Visitors from near and far, we especially welcome you. We hope that you'll say hello in the chat and that you might send an email to our membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas at maceot at ethicalsociety.org. You can also fill out a connection form and someone will put that link into the chat. We hope you'll join us after platform this morning at the virtual coffee hour for a chance to say hello. Our chat will stay open through much of the platform service, closing after the address, uh, excuse me, closing during the address itself and then reopening. If you don't want to see the chat, this is a good time to minimize it. Closed captioning is also available and you can turn that on or off as you prefer. Each week, we read our statement of purpose as a reminder of our shared values. If you are interested in taking a turn to read the Statement of Purpose, you can sign up at tiny.cc slash readSOP. Our reader this morning is Patty Apsher, and um, excuse me. She's a member of the Immigration Justice Team. And I will now turn it over to Patty for a brief announcement and the statement of purpose. Patty. Thank you, Judy. Great to be here this morning. I'm uh, especially excited because this week, Thursday, the Immigration Film Festival the eighth annual consecutive Immigration Film Festival is getting launched. Hi, Patty, you've muted again. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I guess I was, I thought I was unmuted, but um, I'm here to tell you about the Immigration Film Festival that's being relaunched um, this Thursday, and it's going to run through Sunday, 29 films all about uh, many aspects of immigration and refugees uh, worldwide. Some of these films are just very, very thoughtful, very clever. They represent people from all over the world uh, who are involved with the film festival. It started here at West. We worked on it starting for about 10 years ago before we were ready to launch it. And we had many partners, which was wonderful. We made friends with folks from many of the Unitarian churches and other congregations who all contributed to getting it underway. So now uh, for the statement of purpose. The Washington Ethical Society is a humanistic congregation that affirms the worth of every person. We strive through our relationships to elicit the best in the human spirit. With faith in human goodness, we appreciate each person's unique capacities. We joyfully celebrate together and support each other through life. We nurture a sense of reverence and responsibility for each other and the earth. We warmly invite you to join a community of children and adults as we work for a world where love and justice cross all borders. Thank you so much, Patty. If you have a candle at home, I invite you to light it now as I share our candle lighting words. May we kindle within us the warmth of compassion the light of understanding, and the fire of commitment to build a brighter future for all. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, Patty. Good morning, my name is Lynn Cox. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the interim leader here at the Washington Ethical Society. This is a story that's important to several indigenous peoples of the Great Lakes region. 
Nations who share a version of the story include the Algonquin, the Abenaki, and the Potawatomi. This version is drawn from Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass. I don't know if the story happened exactly this way, but I believe it's true. She fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on an autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear or maybe hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark water below. But in that emptiness, there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust moat in the beam. And as it grew closer, they could see that it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled toward them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, so they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather the loons, the otters, the swans, the beavers, the fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of his shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far. And after a long while, he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered to help, otter, beaver, sturgeon, but the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned gasping for air with their heads ringing. And some did not return at all. Soon only little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all, and he volunteered to go, while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward, and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative. And before long, a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid a helpless human. But then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched. And when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, here, put it on my back and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks from the dab of mud on turtle's back until the whole earth was made. Not by Sky Woman alone but from the alchemy of all of the animal's gifts, coupled with her deep gratitude. Together they formed what we know today as Turtle Island, our home. Like any good guest, Sky Woman had not come empty handed. The bundle was still clutched in her hand. When she had toppled from the hole in Sky World, she had reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there. And in her grasp were branches, fruits and seeds of all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until the word world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through the hole in the sky world allowing the seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, trees and medicines spread everywhere. And now that the animals too had plenty to eat, Many came to live with her on Turtle Island. 
So ends the story. Dr. Kimmerer writes that the Sky Woman story is part of a group of teachings called the original instructions among the original people of the Great Lakes. The stories are like a compass. They provide an orientation, but not a map. And she acknowledges that the actions taken in response to this story might be different in our own time than they were long ago. Dr. Kimmerer writes, the landscape has changed, but the story remains. And as I turn it over and over again, Sky Woman seems to look me in the eye and ask, in return for this gift of a world on turtle's back, what will I give in return? As we move into the centering time of our platform, let's reflect on reciprocity and interdependence, the kinds of values that will carry us forward as we seek justice and repair in our communities, in our society, and with the earth. Each week, we ring a chime in solidarity with people around the world. We're going to try some different things with this segment for a few weeks. Today we will ring the chime just one time. Today I am particularly mindful of Native American and First Peoples, First Nations people in the United States and Canada dealing with the generational trauma of forced boarding schools. These were institutions that stole the families, languages, ceremonies, and even lives of indigenous children from the 1860s well into the latter half of the 20th century. As some of these sites of terror are searched and more atrocities come to light, those who lost or were separated from family members are grieving anew. We open our hearts to truth. As we listen to the chime, let us remember our connection to each other and the world around us and let us commit ourselves to all that calls for our work and our love. Let us open our minds and hearts to the place of quiet, to the silent conversation of loving kindness and to the gentle awareness of this very moment. We continue our meditation in silence and the music that follows. Thank mm -hmm. Yeah. 
This is an excerpt from the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Dr. Wal Kimmerer. I'm sorry, yes, Dr. Wal Kimmerer. Even before I arrived at school, I had all of my answers prepared for the freshman intake interview. I wanted to make a good first impression. There were hardly any women in the forestry school in those days, and certainly none who looked like me. The advisor peered at me over his glasses and said, so why do you want to major in botany? His pencil was poised over the registrar's form. How could I answer, how could I tell him that I was born a botanist, that I had shoeboxes of seeds and poles of pressed leaves under my bed, that I'd stop my bike along the road to identify a new species, that plants colored my dreams, that the plants had chosen me. So I told him the truth. I was proud of my well-planned answer, its freshman sophistication apparent to anyone, the way it showed that I already knew some plants and their habitats, that I had thought deeply about their nature and was clearly well prepared for college work. I had told him that I chose botany because I wanted to learn about why asters and goldenrod looked so beautiful together. I'm sure I was smiling then in my red plaid shirt, but he was not. He laid down his pencil as if there were no need to record what I had said. Miss Wall, he said, fixing me with a disappointed smile, I must tell you that that is not science. That is not at all the sort of thing with which botanists concern themselves. But he promised to put me right. I'll enroll you in general botany so you can learn what it is. And so it began. I had no rejoinder. I had made a mistake. There was no fight in me, only embarrassment at my error. I did not have the words for resistance. He signed me up for my classes, and I was dismissed to go to get my photo taken for registration. I didn't think about it at the time, but it was happening all over again, an echo of my grandfather's first day at school, when he was ordered to leave everything, language, culture, family behind. The professor made me doubt where I came from, what I knew, and claimed that his was the right way to think, only he didn't cut my hair off. If my advisor was correct, the visual effect that so delights a human like me would be irrelevant to the flowers. The real beholder whose eyes they, eye they hope to catch is a bee bent on pollination. Bees perceive many flowers differently than humans do due to their perception of additional spectra such as ultraviolet radi radiation. As it turns out though, Goldenrod and asters appear very similarly to bee eyes and human eyes. We both think they're beautiful. Their striking contrast when they grow together makes them the most attractive target in the whole meadow, a beacon for bees. Growing together, both receive more pollinator visits than they would if they were growing alone. It's a testable hypothesis. It's a question of science, a question of art, and a question of beauty. There was a time when I teetered precariously with an awkward foot in each of two worlds, the scientific and the indigenous, but then I learned to fly, or at least try. It was the bees that showed me how to move between different flowers, to drink the nectar and gather pollen from both. It is this dance of cross-pollination that can produce a new species of knowledge a new way of being in the world. After all, there aren't two worlds, there's just this one good green earth. That September pairing of purple and gold is lived reciprocity. Its wisdom is that the beauty of one is illuminated by the radiance of the other. Science and art, matter and spirit, indigenous knowledge and Western science can they be goldenrod and asters for each other? When I am in their presence, their beauty asks me for reciprocity, to be the complementary color, to make something beautiful in response. Thank you so much, Judy. The neighborhood where I live 
enjoys a canopy of mature trees, and it's not far from a stream. Ours is one of the few backyards without a dog, and so it's a favorite for some of the local wildlife. We are regularly visited by little brown birds we can't quite identify, plus grackles and cardinals. But a few months ago, during the cicada season, a call went out to take down residential bird feeders. There was an uptick in the bird mortality rate and bird feeders were considered a suspect. Without attention to cleaning and fresh food, bird feeders can be dangerous for birds in any season. We figured we would miss our visitors, but there would be plenty for them to eat in the woods throughout the spring and summer, so we took our feeder down. Meanwhile, I had a pile of dirt to deal with. How I got several wheelbarrows full of dirt in a pile next to the driveway is another story. I thought I'd be able to use it in the garden, but the clay content meant it wasn't especially hospitable for vegetables. I didn't have time to deal with it for a couple of weeks, and then I had a resplendent mound sprouting volunteer grasses. And I had a bit of a crisis one Saturday, feeling like a mountain of weeds was an emblem of my failure as a gardener. But I had a full day of work ahead. And so I didn't have time to deal with it yet again. Seeing my distress, my partner and my kids went to work. Now my kids do not like to kill plants. So rather than pull up the volunteer grasses and toss them in the brush pile, they moved dirt and carefully transplanted the volunteers in a decorative border around the patio. And the grasses were perfectly happy in clay soil. They grew. I kept expecting the deer to come along and eat them all up as they did when we attempted to grow hostas, but whatever the deer ate, there was still enough left to allow the mini meadow to keep growing. And it wasn't long before the, grouse, the grasses sp spotted tufty tops and seed pods. One day I noticed the cats staring intently out the window and there were our visitors again. The long grasses and their falling seeds provided cover and food and community for the wrens, the sparrows and the chickadees, the grackles and the cardinals. Chipmunks and squirrels and rabbits had their share. Not long after that, we spotted foxes in the yard and heard the call of a hawk overhead. The little birds still visit and they are part of a whole network of life. The things we plant aren't ours alone. The consequences of how we interact with the land matter to humans, but those consequences do not fall on human neighbors alone. Caring for a habitat meant I stopped worrying about trying to squirrel proof a container of food intended to bring pretty birds into my field of view. And it meant that I had more of a window to understanding how a human can have a place in the family of things, the family of being. I would like to think that shifting attention from a narrow group of animals, pretty birds, and their benefit to me, to a systemic view of a habitat and the potential for positive human role in it, is part of what Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer is suggesting in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. Dr. Kimmerer is described in her official biography as a mother, a scientist, decorated professor, and enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. She searches the intersections of mind, body, and spirit, the meeting places of scientific inquiry and indigenous knowledge, the values held in common by people who listen to the earth. Dr. Kimmerer is looking for a way to cast a positive vision for how humans can be in relationship to the planet, a restorative and just answer to the damage of colonization, grounding a way for humans that can live peacefully and fully with each other and with our more than human beings in our communities. Without shying away from the realities of climate crisis, Dr. Kimmerer uses scientific evidence, stories, and personal experiences to encourage readers to listen to the earth, to imagine a different way of guiding our society, to honor what our collective memories already know about living in harmony. Braiding Sweet Grass is a rich book and I can only share a fragment of its impact on my thinking in a single platform, but I will begin with its calls for respect, reciprocity, 
and gratitude. Respect for indigenous ways of knowing is axiomatic for Dr. Kimmerer, and yet she knows, as someone who has been through and currently operates in the academy, that this respect is not universal. In the excerpt we just heard, her advisor tried to take that respect away from her on her very first day of college. In a later anecdote, she describes how one of her graduate students had to fight with her thesis committee to do research about the impact of different methods of gathering sweetgrass on the health of the sweetgrass population. At the proposal stage, one of the scientists on the committee was dismissive and patronizing and claiming that what the people who had been harvesting those plants for generations knew about what they needed to thrive couldn't possibly be true. Two years of field research and impeccable research and statistical methods showed that the grandmothers had been right all along. That responsible harvesting of sweet grass led to healthier populations than ignoring the plants entirely. How many times have we heard stories like this? For those who do research professionally or who spend time sharing knowledge in public, how many times have we experienced it? Knowledge gained from direct experience, knowledge gained from generations of lived wisdom, knowledge held in community is dismissed as being nonsense, not possibly true, by people who have set themselves up as experts. And when the evidence spoken in their own scientific language proves what the indigenous people or the ancient stories of the traditional healers have said all along, we wonder at what point respect will become part of research methodology. Last month, news reports reached us that fossilized human footprints were found in New Mexico, pushing back the earliest evidence of human habitation on this continent. These tracks were made between 21,000 and 23,000 years ago, when the Ice Age would, was at its peak. And that's much earlier than what academic archaeologists had previously thought based on 13,000 year old stone tools from a prehistoric culture known as the Clovis. Indigenous peoples have been saying for a long time that their stories tell of ancestors here from that long ago, and their stories have been met many times with derision and dismissal from scientists who insist that there could not possibly have been humans here before the Clovis. Similarly, when modern European people first encountered Paleolithic cave art that depicted animals with multiple heads or limbs, it was assumed that these drawings were primitive, unskillful, or perhaps depicting some kind of mythical oddly shaped creature. But now researchers are realizing that flickering lamplight turned these paintings into animations. And they may have been arranged on walls in sequence with each scene being illuminated by a different lamp. If we assume that all of history and geography is a march of progress, and that a modern people of European descent have the most knowledge in all, of all things throughout history, we will miss knowledge held in other times and by other cultures that we don't actually know. Once we look back and see that those of us trained in Western academic tradition might have gotten some things wrong about history, perhaps we will be ready to open ourselves up to the idea that there are things we don't know about the present or about how to approach the future. And this is where braiding sweetgrass comes back into the story. It is vitally important to the survival of the planet that we look at all of the ways available to us to support the Earth's ability to heal. It is vitally important that we relate to each other on an individual, neighborly, and world community level differently than we have under colonization and industrialization so far. Dr. Kimmerer says that the earth is asking us to change our worldview. She's not a science denier. She is a scientist herself. She uses microscopes and statistics and peer reviewed journals and all of the tools of that world. She's saying that science is only one source of knowledge. It is good at answering the questions it was designed to answer. And there are questions that science is not designed to answer. Dr. Kimmerer weaves together three strands of knowledge, indigenous wisdom, indigenous ways of knowing, Western science ways, and knowledge gained from observing the plants themselves. 
by moving through the different ways of knowing, the different kinds of questions, we might learn what we need to know for the planet to survive. Much of what has to change is human behavior. And for human behavior to change, we have to address questions of meaning, purpose, emotion, and belonging. And so we bring respect back into the equation. By respecting indigenous ways of knowing, by respecting traditions and cultures who value their relationships with more than human living things, we can begin to address meaning and purpose. We can begin to learn ways of interacting with the interdependence ecosystems where we live that the laser focus of Western science may have missed. You may remember the 2019 UN report on biodiversity. It was yet another study that brought us face to face with the urgency of addressing environmental justice. One of the findings of that report was that nature managed by indigenous peoples and local communities is under increasing pressure, but is generally declining less rapidly than other lands. Here in the United States, our governmental policies are only just beginning to acknowledge the value and importance of guidance from and partnership with indigenous people in the management of parks, reserves, and open spaces. When and where to cut down trees, which plants to harvest and how, sustaining balanced populations of wildlife are all questions that the local indigenous people have already studied over generations. And yet historically, they have been removed from what we call public lands and punished for practicing what they know about managing those lands to the detriment of the land and all of us. In all of our public policies, we should advocate for respect for indigenous ways of knowing. Respect on the individual level is a reflection of respect as a cultural value. On a small scale, one outgrowth of that respect can also be viewed as reciprocity. We value the practice of giving, not just taking, in our relationship with other beings. Dr. Kimmerer outlines some common themes about wise, respectful, and reciprocal actions in relationship to plants and animals called the honorable harvest. She says these aren't written rules and different cultures will express them in different ways, but it generally goes like this. Never take the first one so as to avoid taking the last. Ask permission from the plant or animal or other being. Listen for the answer. Take only what you need. Use everything you take. Minimize harm in the way you harvest. And this can include new technologies. Be grateful. Share what you have taken. Reciprocate the gift. Dr. Kimmerer says that reciprocity, giving back, and keeping the circle of generosity flowing is foundational to honorable, wise, and sustainable ways of being. In my garden over the last month or two, the plants that are hanging on the longest are the cherry tomatoes. At the beginning of the season, I had a little fun joking about the squirrels with larceny in their hearts, and I had some frustration about the bugs who wanted to turn my garden into their nursery. But if nothing else is trying to eat your garden, something is wrong. I call it my garden, but I don't really make the tomatoes. Earlier in the season, I didn't make the cucumbers or the carrots or the shard or anything else that grew there. I did help. I planted the seeds, I added water when the rain was slow in coming, I put some compost into the soil. But there is a way in which the plants belong to themselves. They grew through a process that I was powerless to control. And so it makes sense that I give up some of what grows in the garden because it wasn't entirely mine to begin with. The idea that we own the land and all of the fruits thereof is not a universal value. So I give some back. When a cherry tomato splits on the vine, which it does more often in rainy weather, I don't mind slipping it through the fence where a bird or a squirrel is likely to find it. Or if I've got several, taking them to the brush pile at the far side of the yard where I know my more than human neighbors like to congregate in the early morning. Some of the seeds may turn into volunteer tomatoes in surprising places next year. When branches fall or have to be pruned, I cut them up to speed up the decomposition process and add them to the compost pile so they can give back again to the gardens of the future. 
With inspiration from this book, I'm looking and listening more carefully in my harvest. Is this tomato ready to come inside? Does this tomato prefer to go directly to compost? Does this tomato need more time on the vine? Asking permission and waiting for an answer doesn't need to be imaginative or speculative. It can mean opening awareness to all of the evidence, not just need or desire. Check the color, the other vines nearby, the overall signs of health of the plant. Lately, I'm taking more time to be grateful for each small tomato and to think of new ways to share the gift. And I'm thinking about how to give back. What else does this garden need as the season comes to a close? What else does the other land around me need? In the wild, some of the plants that have adapted to interactions with humans might benefit if their seeds take a walk for a few yards, or if there's a gift of leaf compost left by the roots. Reciprocity in our relationships is harder when we feel a sense of scarcity. When we are low resourced, depressed, disconnected, hungry, or tired, it is harder to resist taking the first or last of what we want or need. It is harder to give back when we doubt that the circle of giving will return to us. And this again is why our movements for justice, including environmental justice, must include ways of engaging with meaning, purpose, and belonging. You can call those spiritual questions if you like, many people do. But even if spiritual is not a relevant word to you, the reality of those human needs remains. Humans are meaning-making, relationship-seeking beings. And when we are engaging well with those questions, we are moved more easily to act in reciprocal ways, in ways that give back and give forward. Noticing the gifts we already have among us can ease that feeling of scarcity. And that brings me to my third point, which is that changing our relationship with the planet requires gratitude. In a chapter about the way the people of the Onondaga Nation begin each gathering with gratitude as expressed in the Thanksgiving address, Dr. Kimmerer reflects on the long-term impact of this daily practice. She writes, you can't listen to the Thanksgiving address without feeling wealthy. And while expressing gratitude seems innocent enough, it is a revolutionary idea. In a consumer society, contentment is a radical proposition. Recognizing abundance rather than scarcity undermines an economy that thrives by creating unmet desires. Gratitude cultivates an ethic of fullness, but the economy needs emptiness. The Thanksgiving address reminds you that you already have everything you need. Gratitude doesn't send you out shopping to find satisfaction. It comes as a gift rather than a commodity, subverting the foundation of the whole economy. That's good medicine for land and people alike. Here we are reminded that how we treat one another as people, how we approach when cultures encounter one another, how we treat the earth that is our home and the beings with whom we share it are all tied together. When we lead with gratitude in our personal relationships, the tone changes. When we lead with gratitude in the way we use energy, we are more inclined to use it wisely. When we lead with gratitude in our intercultural encounters, perhaps we will be more likely to appreciate learning and less likely to dismiss the ways of knowing that are unfamiliar to us. Dr. Kimmerer used the met metaphor of asters and goldenrod to suggest that different ways of knowing enrich and enliven each other. We need scientific knowledge in our quest to change our way of interacting with the planet, in our quest toward healing and justice. And scientific knowledge is not the only way of knowing that we need. It is both wise and ethically congruent to support truth and restorative justice for Native communities as we recognize the historic and ongoing harms of colonization. It is both wise and ethically congruent to recognize indigenous voices and treaty rights when it comes to things like oil pipelines, mountaintop removal, and our relationship with the land. It is both wise and ethically congruent to practice openness and gratitude for more than one way of knowing. By listening with respect to all of our relations, perhaps we may yet help the earth in its capacity for healing. 
may it be so. After some music, we'll have community sharing time when you can write into the chat about what resonated with you today. In the time between, you might prepare for community sharing by reflecting on a personal experience or an activity at West that illustrates the values we're lifting up today. As we contemplate rest and reflect, let us experience the beauty of the musical response. River wide and Naturalist E. O. Wilson writes, There can be no purpose more inspiring than to begin the age of restoration, reweaving the wondrous diversity of life that still surrounds us. Joanna Macy speaks of the great turning, the essential adventure of our time, the shift from the industrial growth society to a life-sustaining civilization. Restoration of land and relationship pushes that turning wheel. Action on behalf of life transforms, because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal. It is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. So lay down your lovely music. Mm. This is the time when we add our own voices to the morning, sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates in our own lives. I invite you to share in the Zoom chat or in the comments if you're watching the recording later. would love to read some of your thoughts. So let us see. Vincent says, Lynn, I thought this was one of the best platforms I heard you give. I really listened to all of it. Thumbs up to the content and meaning of it. Robin, lovely platform. Thank you, Lynn. This reminds me of the experience living with the land at Epcot and the final thought the ride leaves you with until we learn to manage and maintain a sustainable living relationship with the earth, then and only then will there be truly living with the land. I love how in a busy place like Disney World, there's space to slow down and think about how we're all connected. Thank you, Robin. Sonia says, I was thinking that one of the problems is that the default assumption is that the indigenous ways of knowing are wrong and therefore need to be proved with modern science 
before we consider applying them, rather than assuming that they are true until proven otherwise. Peter Bishop shares, Listening with respect is a very important idea. In the philosophy group, we have just been reading about the personal experience of a professor of philosophy who realized that he needed to try to learn from his students and that this was how he was able to teach them most effectively. Lynn thanks Vincent. Adam says, darn squirrels. And for me, Peter, the, in my opinion, educators who don't understand that education is a two-way street are doing it wrong. Susan Ewing says, I've been thinking during platform about lectures I've heard about the differences between natural and human sciences. Very meaningful platform, thank you. Jeff Mehal, I'm amazed how often our European-oriented society continues to get things wrong. Art says, excellent platform. Uh, my return to Wes after a long absence has truly been rewarding or rewarded. Rajesh says, a wonderfully evocative platform. I'm struck by the approach that we take in life of taking, extracting, rather than being in harmony. And Abby Dakin says, it's hard for me to express how deeply this platform moved me. I'll just say that it followed right on from the powerful statement from the ringing of the chime. We open our hearts to the truth. It acknowledges how hard it is to do so and also our commitment to do so. I look forward to hearing, reading further comments. Thank you very much for those comments. And there may be more in the chat later, but for now we'll move on with our platform. And I'm pleased to introduce Hannah Uri from the stewardship team. Thank you, Judy. Um, for those of you who don't know me, as Judy said, my name is Hannah Uri, um, and I'm a member, I serve on Wes's stewardship team. As many of you know, Wes has just begun um, kind of an intensive process for our search for a new leader. And there will be many, many ways for all of us to engage in this important work. Um, but one material way that we can contribute today is to make a financial contribution to our new leader search fund. Uh, we have a goal of raising $7,000 in special one-time contributions to this fund. Uh, and I'm happy to share that we're already halfway there, uh, thanks to our, some of our early donors who are um, include several members of our board of trustees, the new leader search committee itself, and others. Raising the second 3,500 will ensure that the search team has the financial resources necessary to conduct a thorough nationwide search and one in which West members and the search committee have the opportunity to meet potential candidates in person, um, COVID permitting. Um, the costs primarily include travel and lodging. For example, semifinalists generally come out for an in-person interview and the final finalists and their family are brought out for a full week um, of engagement with the community. Our next leader will shape Wes's future for years to come. And we wanna have the resources to make them feel welcome and to conduct um, a, thorough, uh, a thorough search wherein we can all engage in the process. Uh, if you'd like to contribute, uh, the easiest way to give is via Wes's website and just make sure um, that you, from the drop down menu, select uh, leader search and you can give via credit card, debit card, or ACH transfer from your bank there. If you'd like to give in a different way, such as check um, or other method, um, I recommend you reach out to Tom Hutton in the office um, and he can help you. Um, any unspent funds will be returned to the general operating budget and are highly likely to go towards uh, relocation expenses should we select an out of town leader um, who lives out of town. Um, I join you to, I invite you to join me in supporting Wes's search for a new leader um, thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah, for inviting us to be part of the campaign. We also have the regular Sunday collection as another opportunity for generosity. Here at WES, we split the Sunday collection between our operating budget and a fund dedicated to justice and compassion. We appreciate each person's generous giving as they are able. 
This month, half of the offering is dedicated to Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice. The mission of Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice, UUSJ, is to advance equitable national policies and actions aligned with UU values through engagement, education, and advocacy. Some of the core issues that UUSJ works on include voting rights and democracy, environmental action, immigration justice, and economic equality. Local societies that are members of the UUA can be institutional members of UUSJ, and people can be individual members of UUSJ. Gifts to UUSJ support programs such as the Right Here, Right Now, that's W-R-I-T-E, letter writing campaigns to Congress, citizen advocacy training programs such as the Storytelling for Advocacy Project, and public witness activities for social, economic, immigration, and environmental justice. On the slide, you'll see the number to give by text for today's collection, 202-335-1885, and you can also make a gift online through the Donate button on our website at ethicalsociety.org. We'll now receive your gifts and the gift of music. Wonderful music this morning. Thank you so much to the many people who helped to create this morning's time together. Interim music coordinator Leah Morris, Micah Handler, Esther Abrami, Eleuthera Daikonaka Lippert, and Benji Messer. Sorry to uh, mutilate names. The We Thrive Virtual Choir and the West Chorus. Thank you to membership coordinator Maceo Thomas, slide artists John and Abby Dakin, and tech host Sonia Coopers. Thank you to Robin Kravitz for communication support. And thank you to those who are leading and supporting our work in the weeks to come. As always, this week has a variety of opportunities for West members and friends to connect virtually around shared interests and support meetings and discussion groups. We hope you'll join us again next Sunday, October 17th, when Interim Leader Co Lynn Cox will lead a platform about the place of education in the mission and practice of ethical culture. And a few things to look forward to in the days ahead. Today during coffee hour, there'll be a breakout group for visitors and newcomers who would like to learn more about the Washington Ethical Society. Maceo Thomas will be there to answer your questions, whether you're just curious or are looking for the next steps in your involvement with Wes. Several interesting events are happening next week. The pre-K through second grade SEEK class and the high school youth group will meet outdoors during platform. 
Middle school youth will have a meetup after platform. Parents who stay masked and socially distanced will be allowed to bring their phones and tablets into the building to participate in platform and or the membership meeting by Zoom while their children and teens are in class. Please contact Andara or Linda for more information on that. October 17th after platform, please plan to stay for the fall membership meeting by Zoom. There will be an election for the Lay Leadership Development Committee. We'll hear from the task force charged to study the issue of recording membership meetings, and there will be other business to discuss. Members received an email with a link to the full agenda. The 8th Annual Immigration Film Festival, as we heard, begins October 14th. West members have enjoyed this event in the past and are proud to have been the incubator for this project. There will be 29 films screened throughout the one-week festival. Immigration Film Festival attendees can register for free for Zoom links to live virtual screenings. Film Festival attendees can register and there are also options for hybrid events and an in-person an, an in awards event for patrons of the festival. There will be a link in the chat to the Immigration Film Festival website. You can find the details for these and all other events on our website calendar at ethicalsociety.org. And now we're going to welcome Susan Runner with an update from the search committee. And Susan will unmute herself. You're still muted, Susan. Am I unmuted now? OK. Hello from the search committee and good morning. We would like to thank everyone again who filled out the survey. And a summary of the survey results will be available this week, so look out for those. Of primary importance during this update is our upcoming Beyond Categorical Thinking workshop. It will consist of uh, a Zoom meeting uh, that is divided into two hour, two two hour sessions, Friday evening, October 22nd, and from seven to nine, and Saturday, the 23rd from 10 to noon. The workshop is designed to promote inclusive thinking and to avoid discrimination in the selection of a new senior leader. The sessions and the workshop utilizes conversations, case studies of actual events in various communities. Historically, the cases were primarily centered on gender, race, and sexual orientation, but now the program includes gender identity, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, and mental health, among other things. We invite everyone to take advantage of this wonderful opportunity to discuss and grow. To participate, please pre-register at the address I believe is going to be in the chat, and you can also find a link in the email that went out last week about the uh, meeting. Looking ahead, we also will be inviting everyone to join us for cottage meetings, and in some cases, specific focus groups to talk to us directly about your hopes and visions for our next senior leader. We know we've been asking a lot of you lately, but these meetings are our last request, absolutely last request. Keep my fingers crossed. Um, uh, we know um, that you are we're really in, engaged in this and we want you to really participate. We know that we've been um, on your list to do so, so please do. We will be taking a big step in the selection of our next senior leader and the time we invest now will pay dividends in the future. Thanks again for your participation and your support. Well, thank you, Susan. Well, friends, we are nearing the end of platform. Whether you've been uh, with us live on Zoom or later on the recording, thank you for being here with us. 
So let's enjoy now our closing song of the month, We Shall Be Known. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. And now I invite you to join me in our closing words for the month. Let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding and commitment, cultivating relationships with each other, our own conscience and our neighbors in our quest for a better world. Please join us for a virtual coffee hour by pointing your browser to tiny.cc slash westcoffeehour. You can also find the link on the slide or in the chat. Once we're in the Zoom coffee hour space, we'll divide into breakout groups, which you are welcome to drift in and out of as you choose to greet different people. If you are new to our community, please send an email to our membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas, and introduce yourself. And that link to Maceo's email may be in the chat. Um, as mentioned before, there will be a room in coffee hour for uh, further information about Wes. And I hope that you all will have a wonderful week. Look forward to uh, having you join us next week. <laughs>